All right, everybody, welcome back to U.S. Multicultural's U.S. What's this class called? Introduction to Multicultural Literatures of the U.S. Uh, this will be uh, a lecture on, so, well, let me explain. We're switching units now again. And just like I did in the 1950s unit, that mid-century unit, what I've labeled it on the syllabus is magical realism, just as I labeled the 1950s mid-century unit realism. And realism I labeled as pertaining to the novel we read, which was The Martyred, which was a realist novel, among other things. And magical realism very much pertains to the novel we're reading in this unit, which is Louise Erdrich's Antelope Woman. But in presenting the period that we're covering to you, and the period roughly now is the end of the 20th century, so from the 70s to the turn of the millennium, I want to label, give that a bigger label, just as I called that earlier period of the, let's say, 1945 to 1968, I called that mid-century. I now want to call this period the multiculturalist period. Um, and you might be thinking, isn't that strange, because the whole class is about multicultural literature, so haven't we been talking about multiculturalism all along? And I would argue that we have. We have, in fact, been talking about multiculturalism all along, but that framework of, of, of analyzing prior periods didn't really get established. That, that multiculturalist critical lens through which to look at past works didn't really become established until the end of the 20th century. And I think that multiculturalism is a distinct literary period, the period in which that becomes a way that you can look back to works from the mid-century period or the modernist period and say, Yes, those are multiculturalist, even though that word didn't really exist when Nella Larson was writing or when Richard E. Kim was writing. So I want to I want to sort of trace that difficult concept. I hope you're following me. So the idea of multiculturalism, the word multiculturalism and multiculturalism as a literary movement is a late 20th century phenomenon. I think it really gets started in the 70s. And I even think it comes sort of to an end in the early 21st century. I wouldn't even be surprised if this class were called something else in the future because multiculturalism feels like a term that doesn't quite capture um, the priorities of people who 20 years ago would have been multiculturalists now, who are apt to speak less of multiculturalism today and more of things like um, equity or social justice or things like that. And, and so we're going to trace some of those issues. So um, I hope that's clear. I want to argue that multiculturalism is itself a distinct period within American literature. It was within that period that works like Nella Larson's Quicksand or the poetry of Gwendolyn Brooks uh, become available to be reread in the light of multiculturalist ideas because it was in the multiculturalist period that it was um, became a priority to open up the literary canon to voices that were not the white male voices that had dominated before. Okay, so I'm going to explain all that in a moment. So multiculturalism will be the unofficial name of this unit even though magical realism a term i probably won't explain until the next lecture is the official name on the syllabus um what are the other things on this slide so i want to point to the quotation i've placed on the slide at the bottom under the word multiculturalism it's a quotation from an african-american novelist named ishmael reed and i pull the quotation from a book called Who We Be, The Colorization of America from 2014, written by Jeff Chang. And this book is in many ways a history of multiculturalism in America. It sort of starts in the 60s, 70s, and comes up until, um, well, as you can see, 2014, till about Obama's re-election. And it sort of traces multiculturalism as a force in American life, particularly with reference to how it's changed popular culture and visual media. So that's Chang's book, and he quotes Ishmael Reed 
in the book. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear that. A buzzer just went, my mail buzzer just went off. I think a package arrived. That's okay, I'll stay with you. Um, so he quotes Ishmael Reed, the African-American novelist um, of the 60s who did a, a great book called Mumbo Jumbo, which if you like um, strange, funny, um, controversial books that are about conspiracy theory and popular culture and alternative histories, I highly recommend Ishmael Reed's Mumbo Jumbo. But anyway, uh, Reed is a, is a controversial figure, like many we've seen in this class, but uh, he has a quote in Chang's book, and I just want to read the quote. He says, the multicultural movement is the movement of the 70s. In the 60s, you had the black arts group, which was very narrow and black, and the counterculture movement, which was very narrow and white. Now you have the multicultural movement, which is mixed up. This is the wave of the future for the whole country. And if you think back to what we've read before in this class, you can see that he, you know, he has a point that we saw Amiri Baraka as the figurehead of the black arts movement, and he had a very exclusivist definition of what it was to be a black person and a black artist. And a lot of people, you know, were excluded from that definition uh, very problematically, including Jewish people, gay people, etc. So when Barack, when uh, Reed says it was very narrow and black, you can see what he means. On the other hand, we looked at the beat poets with Lawrence Ferlinghetti as our example of the countercultural movement, and it was very white. I mean, just as a matter of demographics, it was white. Uh, Baraka himself felt he had to kind of leave that movement because there wasn't enough room for his you know, idea of what his black perspective was. Um, it tended to be, as we saw, kind of appropriative in its approach to other cultures, whether that be African American culture or um, Asian cultures. And so that, you know, has the potential to just seem not broad minded, but rather exploitative and arrogant. Um, similarly, we even saw, you know, Adrian Rich. Um, as an example of the feminist movement of the time, and as I'm going to discuss in a moment, there was a lot of belief that that movement was too narrowly white. I don't think that Adrian Rich could necessarily be accused of that, but other writers at the time could. So he's saying in the 60s you had these movements, but they were kind of segregated by race. And that segregation led to problems within them that made them too exclusivist. And so in the 70s, he says, you get a movement that is opening up and about the intermingling of cultures. And he mentions, um, he just talks about black and white, but I would also say that this is a moment where, um, where Asian American, Native American, Latin American, literature and art come to a prominence that it really hadn't had in the same way before. Um, so there was a prior kind of diversification of American literature that happened in the mid-century, but that tended to be centered on African American writers and Jewish American writers, as well as Catholic writers, most of them white, uh, because the previous, so before the 50s, the establishment was very white Protestant. And so you saw diversification centered on African-American, Jewish-American, and Catholic writers. But um, there was still exceptions like Richard E. Kim notwithstanding, there was still kind of a lot of exclusivity around um, Asian-American, Latin-American, Native American writers. And that would really change in the later 20th century. So I think that's another way in which multiculturalism opened up the, the literary spectrum. Can you open a spectrum? No. Uh, opened up the literary matrix. I don't know. Widened, let's say widened the spectrum. So you have to think very carefully about the words you use. Uh, it widened the spectrum of what was of what was prominent and available in American literature. So I'm going to get into more detail on the next slide. I hope that all makes sense. If you, uh, the image, I usually use a piece of visual art to introduce each new unit. And what I have there is a, uh, a part, a detail of a painting uh, called Fallen Angel by Jean-Michel Basquiat. And Basquiat was a very interesting uh, and influential artist in primarily in the 1980s. He was a Haitian American artist who lived in New York City and he was working at the kind of intersection of popular uh, street art, graffiti art, 
And then that, so with the multicultural and postmodern movements that kind of decimated that idea that there should be a separation between high and low culture, the fine art world, the gallery art world, became very interested in artists like Basquiat who were doing uh, literally street level popular culture. And so he became a superstar artist in the 80s. Uh, he, you know, his paintings were going for uh, I'm never good with realistic figures. Millions of dollars. That's probably too much, but uh, but a lot of money. And, you know, and uh, there's a lot of uh, questions about the, the ethics of that. Was he being exploited? And it also fueled some of the problems in his life. He struggled with addiction and died at a very young age, unfortunately. Um, and there are, he's very interesting, uh, historical figure and you can watch some documentaries about him on YouTube. That's actually where I get my information about Basquiat. Um, I, I don't always read vast scholarly books the way I should. Um, but he's a very compelling figure and I would urge you to check him out as a, a figure who's really exemplary of this period. And I think this image is a really good image for this period. Um, because it has, as you'll see today in today's lecture, I'm going to enumerate some characteristics of literature in the multicultural period. And there's a lot of interest in spirituality and religion. There's a lot of interest in either getting away from dominant Christian paradigms on behalf of the religions of other cultures or revising dominant Christian paradigms in the light of other cultures. And so Basquiat's portrayal of the angel in this um, very sort of chaotic, ecstatic graffiti style is a good example. And if you note what, how he portrays the angel, within the angel's body, he, he gives him or, you know, gives the angel um, visible organs, including genitals, as if to say um, that the old model of the Christian angel as this ideal spiritual figure, he's going to revise that, he's going to bring that down um, to the level of, of the people, of the everyday, of the body. And yet he retains in the in the kind of ecstasy of the brush strokes in this image um, and the the ambiguous but uh, but intense expression on the angel's face and the angel's posture, he retains a sense of spiritual exaltation. And so this idea of combining the spiritual with the everyday, which as you'll see is the essence of magical realism, is I think really captured very beautifully in this painting by Basquiat, who I again recommend that you uh, check out. All right, so I'm going on too long. Let me let me move on. So, what are some characteristics of multiculturalism considered as a literary period? Which again, I'm saying runs from about 1970 to 2000. So we already talked about the 60s. We already talked about the countercultural movements of the 60s, the Black Arts Movement, the Feminist Movement, the Gay Liberation Movement, and as well burgeoning Asian American, Latin American. Native American movements. So all these social movements have big effects, particularly in the world of education. So in the late 60s and early 70s, all of this activism leads to reforms in higher education in the collegiate world, because what was happening was activist students were literally occupying university buildings, sort of sitting in in university buildings, saying, we're not going to move until you respond to our demands until you alter the curriculum to make it more reflective of the actual student body, of the actual composition of who is enrolled in this school and of the United States. And because what had happened before? Well, before, let's just, I'll just stick with literature because it's what I know best. The literary canon or the broader arts canon, so the canon is the um, stuff that you must study. It's the stuff that's considered must reading, the thing you have to read to be educated. That canon generally consisted of writers and artists and thinkers who were very white and very male. Um, I was going to say straight. They, even the, the conservative idea of the canon is not... Uh, is not dominantly straight. But even at that, nobody wanted to talk about that back then. Uh, so that wasn't, that wasn't brought up. So you had this very exclusivist sense of what you had to read, which was books by figures who came derisively to be called dead white males. And 
students, whether they you know belonged to um, communities that were underrepresented, whether they were female students, they said we need to put other works on the agenda. So you had the formation of departments in universities or um, what are they called? Kind of like studies uh, fields in universities that were kind of interdepartmental. So you had the formation of women's studies, black studies, Native American studies, Asian American studies uh, established within universities. And then even within the long-standing departments like the English department, the history department, the art history department, the, I almost said the philosophy department, but I don't think the changes uh, have reached the philosophy department even yet. Don't, don't tell anybody I said that. Um, but you had in these departments, you had changes to what was taught. You had a greater diversification of the literature that was assigned, of the histories that were taught, of the artworks that were looked at. Um, so I would say, I don't actually know this and I don't know how I would find it out, but I would bet that this particular course, the course you're now enrolled in, uh, Introduction to U.S. Multicultural Literatures, probably isn't any older in the University of Minnesota English Department than the 1980s. Um, so, uh, you know, before that, there probably wouldn't have been a course like this. You would have mainly read, there would have been a much greater focus on British authors, uh, even over American authors, and the American authors you would have read would have been very white and very male. Uh, so curricular changes stemming from the activist movements in the 1960s are the first, I think, big characteristic of multiculturalism as a literary period, this revision to what was taught in college. This did not go unchallenged. So particularly in the 1980s, so if the 60s and 70s were a very radical decade, um, the 80s were a very conservative decade. And we've seen this paradigm of, uh, of radicalism and backlash before. You know, the 20s and 30s were very radical decades. The 50s was very conservative. So the 60s and 70s are very radical. The 80s is very conservative. So in the 80s, these curricular changes and demographic changes, because keep in mind what's happening is there are more and more people coming to universities and colleges, and that means more women, more people of color than had ever been before, and that's even following the expansion after World War II, where with the GI Bill, you had a much, even though it was still very white male dominated, you had a very, you had a bigger class spectrum of white men. So in terms of class, race, gender, you just have this burgeoning and broadening of the university population. And that is spurring these changes. Now, there's a backlash to this. There's a lot of people within academia and within the broader political world who are saying, no, we shouldn't make these changes because what we're doing is... Um, uh, uh, let me make the most generous case for it I can. What we're doing is we're altering a system that has seemed to work, even though what the, art, the, the response would be, what's well, not working for everybody, that's why we're making the changes. But they're saying we're altering a system of American culture and American governance that it's dangerous to change because you know it seems to have worked was was their argument i mean there were there were bigger arguments too about you know western culture at large you're putting the fundamentals of western culture at large in danger and that's what's being argued in this backlash period of the 1980s a particular if you want a particular book that's a flashpoint of this moment, I would point you to Alan Bloom, his neoconservative manifesto, The Closing of the American Mind from 1987, which is all about how these curricular changes and the broader cultural changes they portend are dangerous. And then the big moment in mainstream politics is when the Republican, failed Republican presidential candidate, Patrick J. Buchanan, makes a speech at the 1992 Republican convention where he declares a culture war. He says we're in a culture war for the soul of America. So this idea of canon wars and culture wars over what should be taught, because remember, you know, what's taught to young people becomes the foundation of the society. You know, just pragmatically speaking, every, everybody on both sides of this agrees with that. What's taught to young people becomes 
what they foundationally understand their society to be. So it's, it is a really big question. What should be taught to young people? And that's what this war is about. So that's the big picture. You have this burgeoning of the literary canon, the artistic canon, the philosophical canon, and this expansion of what's considered the history you need to study. You can't just study the history of the you know, the white ruling classes. You have to study the history of everybody else as well, even when that calls into question the good of those white ruling classes. So, and then there's a backlash to that. And I would say those, that, that culture war, that canon war defines this 1970 to 2000 period. Now there's other things going on as well. There are, if, if what I've just described uh, above is a conflict between the left, which is in favor of this diversification, and the right, which is more cautious about it or opposed to it, there's also tensions within that left side that we need to talk about. So for instance, uh, feminism undergoes a great deal of change in this period, 1970 to 2000, because what, um, so let me give you a high level view. Generally, there are considered to be three waves of feminism. The first wave is the early 20th century when feminism is focused on women attaining the right to vote, uh, the suffrage movement. And that, that's not all it was about, but that was the kind of the big headline issue. And then feminism goes into a bit of abeyance. That is, it goes into a bit of a retreat in the mid-century period precisely because of those conservative changes in society. I don't mean that word in a strong ideological sense, just in a sense of wanting to preserve tradition. Those conservative changes following from World War II. Then in the 60s, you have the second wave of feminism, which I think is represented um, pretty well in our class by the poems by Ruckheiser and Adrian Rich, even though Ruckheiser was writing a little earlier. And those are focused on, so women did achieve the right to vote. So that wasn't, that wasn't the issue anymore. The issue then became economically, it became access to professions that still barred women from them. So greater access of women to academia, to law, to medicine, and to other professions that were still very exclusive. And just in general, women's greater access to the workplace and to the economic freedom that that portended. Because if you don't have economic freedom, then you don't have personal freedom was the idea. So why was the heterosexual nuclear family so powerful? Well, it was because if women couldn't, uh, you know, get their own job and have their own independent income, then they were incentivized, uh, you might even say coerced, economically to rely on this kind of a family structure just to get by. And that's the sense in which the slogan of this moment was the personal is the political. What seems like a personal choice is actually structured by a set of political decisions. You know, you, you get married to this man, not necessarily because it's the thing you most want to do, but because uh, what choice do you have uh, economically if you can't get a certain kind of job uh, that would allow you to be economically independent? So that's the sense in which the personal is the political. And the personal is the political as well. And this was another focus of second wave feminism because how women were treated, even in private, even in everyday life, is a function of the broader gender ideology at work in the culture. And so second wave feminism focuses very much on, uh, on the, the mistreatment of women, on domestic abuse, sexual harassment, rape, et cetera. In fact, the sexual harassment as a term can't, comes into prominence only in the 1970s as a result of second wave feminism. However, there were critiques from within the left that this version of feminism was itself exclusionary and exclusivist. That it focused too much on what was called gender essentialism. The idea that there's some essential biological reality to being a woman or a man. And I think we see that in No More Masks, or, or what's the poem called? The Poem as Mask by Ruckheiser, which 
which for all its radicalism, nevertheless defines a woman by uh, childbirth, by, by this kind of bodily reality. And with third wave feminism, especially in conjunction with this burgeoning queer movement, which wants to decouple the idea of gender identity from a sense of uh, biology, which wants to say that maleness and femaleness are not a matter of biology, they're a matter of, of identification. So this gender essentialism thereby has to be critiqued. And it was also seen that the second wave of feminism was biased toward a white middle class audience. How was it biased toward a white middle class audience? Well, you can hear it in some of what I said, that a lot of their activism tended to be focused on getting uh, access to the professions for women, the professions of law, medicine, academia, those are middle class or upper middle class professions. Uh, they also tended to focus on disrupting the idea of the nuclear family, but the nuclear family was always a bit of a middle class formation in itself. The working classes tended to, uh, tended to not have that idea that women wouldn't work. That was always a big uh, and I think quite fair complaint of black feminists toward white feminists that it, it sort of erased the historical reality of black women who always uh, had to, to work uh, for various uh, economic and political reasons while the men of the black community were under particular legal threat, for instance. Um, so this white middle class bias. So the feminism had to become more... Um, more open, had to become more diverse, had to incorporate more of these perspectives. So that leads to the third wave of feminism, which has much less of a focus on gender as an essential biological reality and focuses much more on issues that pertain to uh, groups outside the white middle class. And then, as I mentioned before, you have what was in the 60s called the gay liberation movement and then became the broader queer or LGBTQ or LGBTQ plus movement later on, you had um, this movement calling into question a lot of assumptions about gender identity and sexuality, especially in the 80s with the AIDS epidemic, which particularly afflicted that community, that brought a new prominence to those issues, which eventually lead um, to the, the triumph of that movement came with the legalization of gay marriage, though, of course, as I'm sure you know, that was seen as a, as a very insufficient triumph and that much more needs to be done. But so that's one thing, these arguments within the left. Uh, so we have a left-right conflict, and then we have arguments within the left over the shape these movements should take. Now, let's narrow down to the changes that happen in the world of literature. The big thing, I think, is that mainstream U.S. publishing becomes much more open to diversity. And I think that's a result of the curricular changes um, in academia. Uh, you could even describe this in a very crass economic way, right, which is that if you have um, you know, millions of students being required to now read a different canon of books. So publishers are going to be able to make money uh, publishing different kinds of books than they published before. I, I don't want to be, it's not that easy. I don't want to be that cynical that there is that economic consideration. And just in general, I think publishing became aware that even outside of academia, there's audiences they've been neglecting for diverse works of literature. So mainstream U.S. publishing becomes much more open to diversity, and a number of novelists of color, particularly women of color, become major figures from the 1970s on. Because that mid-century moment from the late 40s through the 60s, that would, that's sort of notoriously a very male-dominated moment in American literary culture. Uh, I would even say not only more do male dominated than what came after, but more male dominated than what came before in certain ways. And I think that has a lot to do with some of the changes we talked about. You had m many more men entering universities, and then you have the professionalization of literature with the creative writing degree at a time when uh, that kind of advanced education was still more open to men than to women. And you have the 
actual uh, publishing companies, et cetera, being very male controlled. And so the mid 20th century was a very male dominated moment in US literary culture. Um, whereas I think what followed that became much more dominated by female, not, if not dominated, at least there was a parody of female voices in the late 20th century as changes were made as um, just for instance, now many more women than men earn college degrees and presumably then go on to higher education. Uh, women outnumber men in the publishing field. If you look up the statistics, though, it's still very white, but, uh, but the gender sort of uh, the gender balance has flipped. So, uh, so that's a big change. So women of color in particular come to the fore as major literary figures from the 1970s on. Uh, Leslie Marmon Silko, Alice Walker, Louise Erdrich, who we'll read in this class, Toni Morrison, whom I'm sure you've heard of, Maxine Hahn Kingston, Sandra Cisneros, Trimple Lahiri, and more. And then that's also reflected in other aspects of literary culture. So let's take, for instance, the Nobel Prize in Literature. That's generally considered to be the highest prize an author can receive in the world of literature. Um, it famously, it was denied to Philip Roth, who very much thought he deserved it, but uh, but they, they, the Swedish Academy who awards it disagreed. But nevertheless, they gave the Nobel Prize in Literature beginning in the 1980s through to the early 2000s to many more writers and I've, I've the way I've phrased it here is writers of color and or third world writers and or post-colonial writers which are none of those are mutually exclusive categories but none of them I, I don't mean them all at once so through the 80s and 90s they gave the Nobel Prize to writers of color writers from what was then considered the developing world the global south uh, what was then called the third world or writers from formerly colonized countries. Some of them were white, but nevertheless, uh, that was still kind of a change. So you have Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Vole Soenka, Nagib Mahfouz, Octavio Paz, Nadine Gordimer, Derek Walcott, Toni Morrison, Seamus Heaney, and V.S. Naipaul. Just a very big run of writers from countries that would have been formerly neglected for the Nobel Prize. So there's a big interest throughout in every area of literature from the prize awarding committees to the curriculum in higher education to the mainstream publishing scene is much more interested in getting more diverse than it had been before and getting if I can put it this way diverse in a more diverse way expanding to more and more groups um, and it, by the way it was still a, a white male dominated period even in the late 20th century um, and into the early 21st. I'm not sure I would say it is to the same degree now, but, uh, but still there are these changes that are very visible. So multiculturalism as a literary period. And uh, I want to focus on some of the kind of culture that accompanies this idea of multiculturalism, some of what goes along with it. Uh, so I want to look at, I just want to take almost as a case study in some of the ideological uh, movements that are accompanying this multiculturalism. I wanna look at one example, and then I wanna look at four poems that exhibit what I consider to be the major characteristics of multiculturalism in literature in this period. And then after that, we'll get into our novel for this unit, Louise Erdrich's Antelope Woman, which is probably at the very end of the next lecture. So just as a case study, I want to look at this phrase identity politics, which is a phrase you hear a lot now. Um, it's a phrase that's constantly discussed in contemporary politics, but it was discussed in politics 30 years ago as well. Where does this idea of identity politics come from? What does it mean? And what does it have to do with the literature of the multiculturalist moment? So I want to look at a document I just want to read a few excerpts from, though it's a very short document, so I'm, I'm excerpting almost a third of it, called the Combahee River Collective Statement from 1977. And what's important about this document is most people agree that it's where the phrase identity politics comes from. Whether or not it was kind of used before, this was the document that really solidified the term and the concept of identity politics. So what was this document, this manifesto, what was it arguing for? 
So the Combahee River Collective was a group of black female queer academics in the 1970s, and they named their movement there. So it was called the Combahee River Collective, and they named their group after the Combahee River, which was where a very uh, famous battle ensued between um, enslaved African Americans and and white slave owners and so they they took on this moniker to suggest the the ideological combat they were they considered themselves as engaged in and so i want to read a few excerpts from this manifesto that they write in 1977 to give you an idea of what identity politics means and how it's going to structure some of the literature of this moment and also how um uh, how some of the literature that comes later is going to be maybe a little more nervous about this idea of identity politics. So let's see. I just want to read some of these excerpts. Although we are feminists and lesbians, we feel solidarity with progressive black men and do not advocate the fractionalization that white women who are separatists demand. Our situation as black people necessitates that we have sol solidarity around the fact of race, which white women, of course, do not need to have with white men unless it is their negative solidarity as racial oppressors. We struggle together with black men against racism, while we also struggle with black men about sexism. So here we see a challenge to second wave feminism. A big part of second wave feminism, you saw it in Adrian Rich's poem, was separatism. The idea that women shouldn't live with men, shouldn't sleep with men, that women should form their own communities and their own collective, um, especially if they were lesbians that they should simply not associate with male life in any way. That's what it means to be a, a feminist separatist. And what the Combahee River Collective is saying, and I think speaking on behalf of a lot of black female thinkers at this time, including, for instance, Toni Morrison, who won the Nobel Prize, who made similar statements, she said, you know, they say black women really can't do that because black men are oppressed. They're oppressed as black people. And so black people need to stick together regardless of gender to fight racism. So this is one of the ways in which it's insufficient just to think about gender. And here you see the, the roots of what will later be called intersectionality, which is a word that will be coined in, I think, the 80s, which is that you have to take into account race, gender, class, sexuality. You can't just focus on one of these things to tell you what your politics should be. Nevertheless, though, the idea of identity politics says that whatever the complexity of your identity vis-a-vis -vis class, race, gender, sexuality, it still needs to be rooted in that identity. So here's the next part. This focusing upon our own oppression, i.e. as black women, is embodied in the concept of identity politics. We believe that the most profound and potentially most radical politics come directly out of our own identity, as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. In the case of black women, this is a particularly repugnant, dangerous, threatening, and therefore revolutionary concept, because it is obvious from looking at all the political movements that have preceded us that anyone is more worthy of liberation than ourselves. And I want to read a bit of the next excerpt, too. Um, we might use, that is black women, might use our position at the bottom, however, to make a clear leap into revolutionary action. If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free, since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. So what identity politics means is that a person's politics should be rooted in their identity with regard to gender, race, class, and sexuality, and their solidarity with others of the, that identity. And if you don't do that, you're just working for somebody else. You're not working to liberate yourself. And you might say, and people have said about identity politics, well, isn't that a bit um, selfish? Isn't that a bit uh, to a form of sort of group narcissism? They explain that it is not. And I want to look at the logic with which they explain it. 
we might use our position at the bottom to make a clear leap into revolutionary action. If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free. So here's the idea. We have to take a little detour into Marxist theory. So we, we have read in this class anti-communist literature by Richard E. Kim. We've read literature that I think is generally hostile to a Marxist concept of humanity. I, I think Philip Roth and his individualism is generally hostile to a, any kind of a Marxist idea. Um, so we've definitely seen, heard the anti-Marxist case. So now let me, let me introduce you to the Marxist case, which is this. So Karl Marx, back in the, in the 1800s, in the 19th century, he's trying to figure out how you can get to a society where everyone is equal. Now, there had long been, throughout all of human history, dreams of this kind of a society. Uh, in many ways, it's what the, the you know what, what Christianity promises at the end of the era. But how do you? But Karl Marx wasn't a Christian; he was an atheist. So how do you get there on Earth? How do you get there in a secular sense? You can't just you know say, oh, everybody should be nice. Marx, a very sardonic man, had extreme contempt for that idea that everyone should just be nice. Now he thought it was going to take a struggle. But what what form would the struggle take? The thing that separated Marxism from what came before it, which Marx derided as merely utopianism, was the following. You had to find the group in society that was the most oppressed. And once you found that group, then you knew who was the protagonist of the struggle for equality. Because once you find the group that's at the bottom of the system of oppression, you then know that if they succeed in their struggle to overcome their oppression because they're at the very bottom at the foundation of the oppressive system they'll knock the whole thing down and what will be left will be equality after some this is always the problem in marxism after some after some something that nobody knows what it is there'll be equality but but sorry i'm being sarcastic but the, the first part of the theory, I think, is good. You have to find the group whose oppression is the form of oppression that structures all other forms of oppression above it. And once you've isolated that group, you will know which group struggle to back because they'll destroy the whole system. And that's the necessary precondition for that equality. Okay? So now Karl Marx thought it was the industrial working class, the... the people who worked in the factories he thought were the people who were at bottom exploited under capitalism and when they fought back, back they would destroy the whole system of capitalism and bring about communism for a wide variety of reasons that didn't happen he was wrong however the principle remained on the left that you had to find the this group is often called you have to find the revolutionary subject that is to say the group of people who are oppressed in the worst way, and so their oppression will destroy the whole system. The, 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 the destruction of their oppression will destroy the whole system of oppression. So that's what makes the Combahee River Collective Statement a revolutionary statement. They identify black women, or more specifically black lesbian women, as the most oppressed group in American society, and if they uh, wage a struggle rooted in their own identity as black lesbian women, that will destroy the system that oppresses everybody else, whether that's black men, whether that's white women, whether that's working class people of all races. The whole system will come down because their identity politics has triumphed. And in that sense, I think Marxism always was identity politics. Marxism because people today say Marxism and identity politics are at odds. I don't think they're at odds. I think Marxism always said you need to identify the group whose struggle rooted in its own identity will bring down the system. And that's what identity politics means. And I think that's a priority you're going to see in a lot, uh, not all by any means, uh, many of the writers uh, of this period were perfectly moderate liberals, actually, politically. But a lot of the uh, 
a lot of the literature of the multiculturalist period, I think, is backed by this idea of identity politics, that a political struggle rooted in one's own identity, if one's own identity is most oppressed or even meaningfully oppressed, increases the level of freedom in society. So that's the Combahee River Collective Statement. That's identity politics in its revolutionary formulation. Um, and also, I just again want to emphasize this idea that would develop of a kind of intersectional approach. So the Combahee River Collective Statement was published, among other venues, in a book called All the Women Are White, All the Men Are Black, But Some of Us Are Brave, Black Women's Studies. And I think that was the that was the objection of the Combahee River Collective, that the way the political movements of the 1960s worked was that feminism was considered a white movement and the various movements for black liberation were considered a male movement. And so where, where did black women have a voice? And so they were trying to provide that. And they, they nominate black women, black queer women, as the revolutionary subject. And I think that that is uh, a, a background, a kind of backbeat of a lot of the literature of this period, even you know, literature by people that were not specifically black and or female and or queer, were still drawing on this notion of identity politics. All right, so, boy, I've talked a long time. Uh, so uh, I'll talk for about 10 or 15 more minutes. So let's get into some literature now let's look i want to read four poems with you i'll probably get through one today and i want to use these four poems uh, as evidence for the claim that there are four major characteristics of multiculturalism uh, as a literary period uh, there are more I, I don't mean to limit it to four but i when i think about it i think that these four things really uh, become very prominent and then that'll be a good lead into Louise Erdrich's Antelope Woman, which we will begin a discussion of next, uh, in the next lecture. So the first poem I want to look at is To Doe Street by Yusuf Kamanyaka. And pictured on the slide is Yusuf Kamanyaka. And I want to use this as an example of the idea that literature in the multiculturalist identity politics period needs to interrogate history. And here's what I mean by that. If before the curricular changes of the late 60s and early 70s, the canon of literary studies, of philosophy, of art history, etc., was very white male dominated, so the histories that were taught were very much dominated by the white ruling classes. So, for instance, if you took a history class, I'm going to be a little too uh, I'm going to make this a little more more blatant than it was, but let's say you took an American history class and it would focus very much on the, who was the president, what was their sort of diplomatic policy, uh, you know, who was in Congress, who were the senators. It had this very top-down focus. Who were the leaders of society and what did they do? And it approached that subject in, in a way that tended to valorize those leaders of society, the, you know, the greatness of the founding fathers, etc. Well, if you're opening up the curriculum to groups that had been previously excluded, you're also necessarily opening, an, opening it up to groups that have a case to make that those previous ruling classes of society did harm to, to them as groups. That you had to talk about um, slavery and Jim Crow and the various forms of oppression of African Americans if you really want to open up American history. You have to talk about the displacement, the removal, and the murder of Native Americans. You have to talk about things like the internment of Japanese people during World War II or the exploitation of Mexican-American labor throughout the 20th century, or the long-standing oppression in various ways of women of many races and classes throughout American history. That's what I mean by interrogating history. You can't just tell the story of America or of any other nation or of the world as a set of triumphs on behalf of 
the ruling classes. You have to, uh, what was often said was you had to look at history from below what history looked like from the perspective of people who weren't the victors in the, in the political, economic, and even physical struggles of their time. So the interrogation of history is a big characteristic of multicultural literature. A lot of the novels of, um, of this period were historical novels. The historical novel makes a big comeback, and The Antelope Woman is at least in part a historical novel. Uh, so there's a lot of re re-examining history. And I think that happens in Yusuf Kamenyaka's poem to Doe Street of 1988. So briefly, Yusuf Kamenyaka was born in uh, Bogalusa, Louisiana. His father was a carpenter, and he was very much influenced early in his life by the Bible and by the church. And then the key moment early in his life that famously influences his poetry is he served in the Vietnam War. Um, I don't, he wasn't in combat. He was a correspondent and an editor of a kind of military newspaper. So well, I think he wasn't directly in combat. He certainly saw, witnessed a lot of violence. And this was a very formative experience early in his life. And a lot of his poems that he, he, became, he becomes a pretty famous poet in the 80s, writing poems reflecting his experience in the Vietnam War. So he was educated at the University of Colorado and got an MFA in poetry, a Master of Fine Arts degree at California Irvine. So um, a lot of the writers we're going to read from now on, um, really this started back with Richard E. Kim, are people who have degrees in creative writing. That, that's that professionalization of literature we were talking about. He's known for his uh, themes of war and his reflections on the Vietnam War, as, as well as his um, it's not necessarily evident in this poem, but his use of African-American vernacular and jazz rhythms in his poetry. Uh, he was active from the 70s through today. Uh, he's still alive, still writing, and won a Pulitzer Prize, and I think he currently teaches at New York University. So this is a poem about his experience in the Vietnam War, and I think it's a, a poem that's that very much interrogates history in the sense that the Vietnam War was the war, I think, where the triumphal story of American um, victory and virtue really got called into question. I think there was a big movement to end the war while it was going on. I think after the war, it was largely regarded as a failure, as a mistake. Uh, if not, even I think, even I think in, on the more moderate or right wing side of American politics, that's true. And then I think on the on the more left wing side is regarded as an act of imperialism. So uh, this was a war not in a, in a way similar to the Korean War, which we already discussed, where America was intervening uh, in a proxy civil war on behalf of the capitalist liberal democratic system against a communist system. Um, but unlike the Korean War, it went on for a very long time. It was extremely brutal, uh, extremely violent, um, and there was a rebellion in the country to end the war. And there were a lot of people fighting the war who were not very interested in, in, in thinking this was a just cause, which, you know, I don't make political claims in this class. You look into it, you make up your mind. But the perspective this poem is coming from is calling into question that triumphalism. So let, I'm just going to read the poem, and then I want to make a few remarks about it. Music divides the evening. I close my eyes and can see men drawing lines in the dust. America pushes through the membrane of mist and smoke, and I'm a small boy again in Bogalusa, white-only signs, and Hank Snow. But tonight I walk into a place where bar girls fade like tropical birds. When I order a beer, the mama-san behind the counter acts as if she can't understand, while her eyes skirt each white face, as Hank Williams calls from the psychedelic jukebox. We have played Judas, where only machine gun fire brings us together. Down the street, black GIs hold to their turf also. An off-limit sign pulls me deeper into alleys as I look for a softness behind these voices wounded by their beauty and war. Back in the bush at Docto and Quezon, we fought the brothers of these women we now run to hold in our arms. 
there's more than a nation inside us as black and white soldiers touch the same lovers minutes apart tasting each other's breath without knowing these rooms run into each other like tunnels leading to the underworld all right so i would say this poem interrogates history in two ways the first way is that it shows us the segregation in the u.s armed forces and keep in mind formal legal segregation in the u.s armed forces ended in the late 40s so he's not talking about formal legal segregation it, it would have been illegal to segregate soldiers by race but he's saying that the cultural change has lagged well behind the legal change and that in vietnam white soldiers and black soldiers are segregated from each other and that there's bars where that are white only and bars where only black people go and so he says i'm a boy i'm a small boy again in bogalusa it says if he were still living in the jim crow south and he talks about music dividing the evening and if you look up the musical references in the poem he's talking about different music listened to you know stereotypically by by white and black individuals so he's saying that despite the fact that this is supposed to be a war for freedom and a war for democracy it's still a war fought by a segregated army structured by racism okay we have played judas we have betrayed this cause just as judas betrays jesus we have betrayed each other we have betrayed this cause by this segregation so that's one way in which kamenyaka interrogates history he calls into question the presumed virtue of the u.s forces fighting this war ostensibly on behalf of freedom and democracy when there are these undemocratic unfree aspects to their to their to their armed forces and thus to their society the second half of the poem gets a little more uh disturbing in a certain way it's it's an issue we've seen raised before in this class and for instance picasso's work which is the the portrayal of male desire sexual desire in the context of a brothel in the context of sex work and so what happens in the second half of the poem is Komanyaka is remarking that the, the army and this would have been a, an all-male army at this point is visiting sex workers in vietnam they're visiting prostitutes and he's remarking on the irony that the army is segregated and there are places where only white soldiers go and only black soldiers go but they're sleeping with the same women and not only that there's yet another irony which is they're sleeping with women whose brothers they are fighting that in fact the you know these vietnamese women their their brothers or other male relatives are the soldiers that the american soldiers are fighting and so what he's saying is there's this kind of bizarre transaction going on where all of these opposed men vietnamese african-american white american are sort of communing in this sexual act and I would say the poem ends on a sort of scary note. These rooms run into each other like tunnels leading to the underworld. So that reference to the underworld, this place of death, even a hellish place, suggests to me, I think a, a bad way of reading this poem would, would be to that he's creating this utopia, this multicultural utopia where all these multiracial men are mingling in this sex act. I think that's too simplistic a reading. I think he's implicitly continuing to interrogate history by showing uh that you know the, the, what's happening is violence what's happening is death and this sexual communing of vietnamese african-american and white american men is really not sufficient because if the first part of the poem is reminding us that somebody's left out of the triumphal story of american virtue which is african-american men who are still fighting in a segregated army that belies that betrays that undercuts their claim to be fighting on behalf of freedom and democracy 
So in the second half of the poem, we also have to ask, well, whose voice is being excluded? Whose, whose voice, in fact, is Komunyaka signaling to us he can't quite represent in his own poem? And I would argue that it's the body of those Vietnamese women who are their, their sort of bodies over which this racial and ideological conflict is being staged. What would history look like if it were told from that perspective? It's not, it's going to be different from if it's told from white American, black American, or Vietnamese pers male perspectives. It's going to be different from any male perspective. So I think Komunyaka is signaling to us at the end to not only remember that he's giving us a voice that's been left out of the official story, but there's a voice left out of his story that we also need to be thinking about. So this interrogation of history can never really end. No voice can tell the whole story. We need to attend to what's absent in his poem, which is the voice, voices of the Vietnamese women over whose bodies he transacts his conflict with white American men on the one hand and Vietnamese men on the other. Now, that, there is another reading of this poem which would just say that it, it, it's kind of, um, uh, it's naively sexist, that it, it, it actually just does represent these women as kind of inert figures. And you could make that case. I, I'm not saying that's not a case. But, uh, but the more hopeful reading is that he's signaling to us that we can't think of it that way. That just as his voice was excluded from the official story, their voices are excluded from his story, but he points to it, but he gestures to it. But the whole drift of the poem tells us not to neglect it. And so that's the sense in which Tudeau Street interrogates history, offers history from below, argues on behalf of history from below. So I think that's a good place to end uh, today. Just looking ahead, I want to look at I's poem, The Kid, at um, Garrett Hongo's poem, The Legend, and Paula Gunn Allen's poem, Grandmother, not necessarily in that order, in order to illustrate three other characteristics of multicultural literature. And then in the next lecture, I will also begin to introduce our novel, Antelope Woman. And then in the next two lectures, they will be devoted entirely to the text of Antelope Woman. So thank you very much. I hope that was uh, helpful, and I hope you have a great day.